welcome to our second uh, presentation on natural and cultural heritage. I'm going to call on Mark Moore, who is the Heritage Coordinator of the City, to introduce our guest speaker. And um, Mark, will, uh, Mark works with Peter Carlos, and so he'll give you some insights into uh, some of the things that are happening in, in relation to a community that they are going on. Mark, thanks, Jay. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce to our, our guest speaker tonight, Peter Carruthers. Um, I'm reading off Peter's notes here, so it should be accurate as to who Peter is and what Peter does. So if they're not accurate, you can find Peter. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter is currently the Environmental Assessment Coordinator for the Ministry of Culture, Tourism, and Recreation. And he is responsible in that position for ensuring that uh, activities carried out under the Environmental Assessment Act and the Planning Act um, take cultural heritage into consideration. Peter also works with the Waterfront Regeneration Trust on the Greenway Strategy, and uh, I'm also on that working committee, Heritage Cultural Work Group, uh, with Peter. And so I've had the pleasure of working with him for the past year. Thanks. Uh, past positions that Peter has held of a variety of things uh, with research, planning, policy, education, regulatory, and administrative roles with uh, Ontario's Heritage Conservation Mandate. Uh, he's also worked as a coordinator of the archaeological program for the Ontario Heritage Foundation from 1979 to 85. Uh, he's worked with Grant and Research Administration work for the Canada Council in Ottawa. Uh, he's also completed field work in Ontario. Uh, the subarctic, western Canada, and midwestern US. So, see, Peter has been around, gets around. Uh, it's also completed studies in geography at the University of Western Ontario, archaeology and anthropology at the University of Toronto, uh, Calgary, and Wisconsin. So, you can see Peter comes from a, a varied background. Um, tonight, his topic is on community, habitat, and landscape, planning units for the new millennium. And I'll let Peter explain exactly what that means. <laughs> I should take those notes and check them out. <laughs> I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Annie tells me that, uh, you know, some of you, I don't know, all of you by name, so she tells me there's a hockey game tonight. Um, and uh, so I'm sure we'll all be free to get home and watch it. Because it's very much a part of our game and heritage. <laughs> it's hard for what we're talking about. Um, Mark uh, mentioned some things that I sent as you know, as, as far as what uh, what my uh, my background is, and, uh, and most of it's true. Uh, the um, <laughs> The geographical side of it, though, has been very uh, formative as far as my uh, approach to things is concerned. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to study uh, planning back at uh, Western from some of the people who were just developing the uh, regional planning uh, system, uh, followed by you know, Plava and others. Uh, planning, land use planning was in a fair state of infancy in those days, but uh, it was uh, a pretty interesting and audacious thing to uh, watch people presume to, you know, put together regions in the province and uh, change the names of things and do all this sort of stuff. As we've seen uh, subsequently, it's with a greater or lesser degree of success, but at the time, it seemed uh, uh, pretty exciting uh, in the same way that, say, Highway 401, with its 12 or 16 or 20 lanes, always seemed sort of exciting and a source of pride when you drove along there. Um, and then gradually, it sort of stopped being that way. Ideas tend to change, and attitudes change, and things evolve fairly rapidly. So uh, it's uh, it's wise to be aware of that because we're all part of that that uh, that change. Now, um, and, and and I guess my reason for saying that is that, and I'll get back to it later on. Um, we uh, we tend to be uh, very quick to criticize the way people are doing things. And, uh, and yet, very often, we're part of the formative process that uh, began and contributed to it. Now, um, I've been involved in a lot of different uh, land use planning uh, uh, sorts of activities. And, and, and when you're involved that way, and for those of you in planning, uh, maybe even here at Mississauga, 
uh, you sort of come in very close contact with developers and uh, other planning agencies, uh, government people, uh, people in the private sector across the board. And you all know, as I do, that uh, we are living in a time of tremendous anxiety. Uh, it's bizarre. I mean, you get together with your friends and people are talking about their jobs and uh, uh, whether or not they're even sleeping at night um, or maybe even what drugs they're taking. I mean, it's a whole range of different approaches. But nonetheless, uh, this business about anxiety is really uh, um, very, very common. We have um, anxiety in every sector of the, um, the economy in our society. I mean, in the development community, people are anxious. In the commercial and retail community, people are anxious. Manufacturing, resource extraction, any number of those sectors, everybody is nervous. Why is everybody nervous? I mean, is there nobody out there? There's, except maybe those people who are fortunate to be retired and, uh, and profoundly wealthy. Um, we don't know us knowing of those people, or we certainly wouldn't be here tonight. But, uh, I mean, somebody out there must not be nervous, but most of the people I know are. So we're living in a, a very bizarre time. And, uh, and we, can, we can point to the economy, and we can point to uh, uh, unemployment, and we can point to free trade. We can grope around for uh, explanations, but it's very difficult to put our finger on. And one of the things that occurred to me was that uh, one of the reasons is that we're moving towards the year uh, 2000. Um, on the surface, that might seem kind of an odd thing to say, but uh, um, there is, on the one hand, a tendency to look at the year 2000 as being uh, a time of great promise. I mean, after all, a new millennium. Um, we're no longer in the, uh, this old, tired millennium that we've been in for such a long time. A thousand years, almost. Uh, it seems like a long time. But uh, I, I, I want to talk about how short a time it actually is and uh, how, uh, how we are all very much a product of the millennium that's almost over. Uh, now, one of, the, one of the responses to this anxiety that we, we feel uh, and uh, see these days is the, uh, the number of different attempts there are going on to change the planning system, to improve things. People are working very, very, very hard to change things. And it's surprising when you look around. I mean, Sewell is a very obvious example. But there is all the work that's being done in the greater Toronto area. There's the work that's being done on the old bridges. There's a review going on, just finishing now, on the Niagara Escarpment uh, plan. There are um, uh, uh, attempts being made to incorporate biodiversity conservation into the planning system. Natural resources is changing their whole approach to the planet. Everybody is doing serious work on how it is that we've done things traditionally in the past. And everybody is really nervous about it because they know that something's got to change. Things have to change. And they haven't really quite figured out how to do it. And people are laboring mightily to try and do the right thing. And they're trying to do the right thing in a context of a lot of these old ideas. And uh, it's uh, those things I want to talk about uh, uh, tonight. The, um, the opportunity to come talk to a group of people is in some way an imposition on you, and I hope you'll uh, bear with me, uh, because um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to uh, try out a few ideas. And if they're totally up to lunch, I expect to hear about it. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of an experiment, in a way. And um, um, I don't really know what I'm talking about um, in a lot of areas. But I do have this geographical background, and I have a very strong background in heritage, in general history, archaeology, and anthropology. And I've got a lot of experience in land use planning. But first and foremost, what I really love is landscapes. And I never knew that before until I started working with the, uh, the trust, and I started working with landscape architects. I know a lot of architects in my time, but I never really hung around landscape architects. I always thought of them as the people who were called in later to put in the uh, railway ties and the gardens to plant the shrubs and figure out where the sidewalks were supposed to go. None of that was important, of course. The building was the thing, or the subdivision or whatever. And there were these landscape architects scurrying around doing all this stuff. But what I've come to understand is that these people are really interesting. They have a geographical approach to the land. They see things in relationship to one another that most of us miss. They're extremely interesting people indeed. 
And there are also landscape architects who put in railway ties and shrubs and decide where the sidewalks are going to go. And that's interesting too. But I'm talking about the fact that these people, this whole field of landscape architecture, these people are trained to see things in a systematic way. And it, it, it resonates with the way, I never realized it before, but it resonates with the way I've always looked at the land. For me, I've taken um, geological or uh, physiographic, uh, topographical features as ways of interpreting the landscape. I've used archaeology as a way of getting into it, in imagining how the landscape used to be. Um, but I never realized before that the first and foremost thing to me, the most important thing, is landscape. And so I, I, I want to talk about that because so much of that is influenced by how we see things and what our cultural background is. And that changes too, just as landscapes change. So um, I want to, uh, first of all, get this thing up, um, off my chest about uh, the new millennium. Um, I had an opportunity to go to France recently, and uh, I was doing research. I, I just around the time Dave phone. And so in a way, this is her fault. And, and so it's good that she's here, because she could have actually said, you know, phone is sick or something. So this is partly Gay's fault. And um, I want to talk about what I discovered about the old millennium, not the new millennium. Because as I was reading about France, now remember that um, not all of us, of course, are from, uh, rooted in Western Europe, many of us are. And to a large extent, the values that prevail in the dominant culture in Canada are from Western Europe. So it, pays, it, 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 it makes a certain kind of sense that we should look at that, although most people look back 100 years or 200 years or 300 years. But it struck me as I was reading all this weird stuff uh, that the turn of the millennium back then was similar to the turn of the millennium now. And it, it, it seemed kind of strange. Um, now, we've all studied history in school and probably been bored senseless by it. And it's one of the tragedies of education that history doesn't really somehow or another connect. It doesn't help us to really understand a whole lot. But let me just call up a few images for you that uh, might ring uh, uh, in a familiar way. Uh, we all know that the Romans kind of, you know, they came out of Italy and they expanded over Europe. And there was this long period of peace called the Pax Romana. And a lot of interesting things happened then. But because the Romans had to go back home, uh, they had some problems back in Italy. So they had to go back home again. They left a few garrisons here and there and stuff like that. And they trained a bunch of people fairly well to kind of, you know, change the guard and keep the walls up and all that sort of stuff. But basically, the Romans went home. And um, things rapidly kind of went downhill for a while. Because the Romans had things pretty well sewed up, a lot like Marshal Tito in, uh, in the old Yugoslavia. You know, they had some things really nailed down. And with a minimum of power from Rome itself, they had Europe pretty well calmed down and function well in an educational sort of sense, in an economic sense, in a whole lot of different senses. One thing that could happen there at, uh, that sort of disintegrated was that people could travel. Well, <coughs> Remember that after the Romans left, that became that beginning of the Dark Ages, what we refer to as Dark Ages. Remember King Arthur? Well, King Arthur was around during that post-Roman period, King Arthur and his knights. Um, the Saxons, you know, the Saxon shore in the south end of uh, England. Uh, that whole thing about uh, the Germanic tribes moving around and uh, a lot of strange things happened. But um, out of that kind of period of some disorganization, there arose a line of people who uh, tried to put it back in shape. And they were called the Carolingians. And they were named after, uh, um, well, King Carol and a whole bunch of people like that. And then there were sons called Pepin the Short and so and so the Bald and all this type of stuff. I mean, all these names that you might remember from history. But uh, one of these guys was Charlemagne, Charles the Great. And he was ultimately finally crowned by the Pope in 800, 800 AD. But there was a period in there of about 200 years during which the Franks, because these guys were Franks, West Franks and East Franks, French, and um, also uh, Germans, in fact, as it turned out, um, they kind of ruled Western Europe for about 200 years. And they brought back a sense of calm and stability 
Uh, Charles the Great was a fairly learned guy. I mean, he was no brilliant man by any means. He was no genius, but he was very, very good at administering. And he was a really tough guy. And he sort of beat up a whole bunch of people, calmed them down. And uh, the roads were open again, the economy was functioning, the ships were on the sea, and trade was going back and forth. And people were relatively happy. They could stay at home, they could farm. Uh, things were kind of okay for a while. Um, and then, inevitably, uh, Charles died. And his sons took over. They didn't know what to do. And then, the period of the Scandinavian pirates. Do you remember that? Like these fellows coming down from the north and raping and pillaging up and down the coasts, you know, and scaring everybody and moving their great long ships deep into Russia along the Vistula River and, and coming up the Seine to Paris and getting beaten up by that guy Odo. And remember all those stories from history? Well, at the same time as the Scandinavians were coming down from the north and scaring the hell out of everybody and uh, kind of uh, looting all these monasteries, um, there were a bunch of Slavs, Bulgars, and Magyars coming in from the uh, east, and they were a nasty bunch of guys too, and there were a whole bunch of Saracens, <clears throat> fierce Saracens as they were described, coming up from the south. And you had Charles the Great's sons, who didn't really know what they were doing, and everything fell apart again. So as they approached the year 1000, the place was in complete chaos. The economy had fallen apart, people didn't have enough food to eat, nothing was predictable, they never knew when raiders were going to show up on their back porch and burn their farms and do all this sort of stuff. And um, they were in a state of very high anxiety. And that's kind of similar to what was going on now. And that's what caught my eye initially. Like I was thinking, wow, things were really weird back then. I read accounts of um, uh, rumors about the burning of the temple in Jerusalem, just you know, going through Europe and everybody going into a state of hysteria. I mean, throughout the entire country. And people uh, uh, experiencing uh, eclipses of the sun and just going nuts, entire towns just going crazy. You know, and people burning down their own houses in, in fear. Um, a lot of very strange things were happening. Now, it's interesting that, that uh, this week we had a, a solar eclipse. Now, we saw some pretty stupid things happen. You know, people standing in the streets sort of looking up like that. <laughs> very stupid. Extremely stupid. I think every time somebody did that, they lost about 5% of their revenue. Now, that's kind of lunatic in a way, but it's not the same thing that was happening back in 1000 or around then. But it was still pretty stupid. We also had a birthday uh, this week. Uh, Charles Soriel had a birthday. And uh, he's, a, he's a person who's contributed a lot to the environmental movement. And believe me, I will get back to the topic <laughs> soon. But what I wanted to do was I, I just wanted to tell you about that that whole transition period because things were so bad around the turn of the old millennium that almost the next thousand years were spent trying to sort it out. Now, it wasn't always successful, um, uh, but remember the feudal period? Well, that came afterwards. That came afterwards, and that was a response to this chaos. The feudal period made sense. Now, it doesn't make sense to think about the knights in shining armor and these people kind of riding around and them, the maids and whatever, whatever they used to call romantic love or all those types of things don't make a lot of sense. I mean, they sound kind of weird. But the fact is the idea of having these villages and towns grouped together around a stronghold with a bunch of knights made sense in a time of chaos. Because only in that way could you protect food production. Only in that way could you ensure the, the safety of travelers from one place to another. And only in that way could you protect the uh, ecclesiastical establishments where information was stored, you know, where the modems were, where the databases were. Information, even back then, was very, very important. So you had this feudal system that built up because they were trying to restore order. And and it's, 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 it's very interesting, but it's particularly interesting when you think about who these people were. Now, I, I was trying to get a, a kind of a, uh, a handle on who these feudal people were. Like, were they like us or um, um, not? And as, as far as I can tell, they were really insecure. Like, they were really insecure people. They were really afraid of a lot of different things. They were afraid of things that we, we haven't believed in for centuries. They were very, very insecure people. Pestilence was rampant. 
the food was bad, the crops were unreliable, they were totally subject to the changes in weather, they had no control. Uncertainty was, I think, uncertainty was the one certain thing that they had. They, they couldn't necessarily trust their neighbors in the next town. They didn't know anything. They didn't know how to read. And they weren't what you'd call a self-examining type of people. They weren't trying to analyze themselves, and they weren't going to shrinks either. However, you know, they functioned, because after all, we're here, aren't we? I mean, they did survive, and they did find something to eat, and we're here. So something worked. And what worked was, I think, this constant striving for information organization, transportation, food, and all that sort of stuff, that although it went up and down, because remember the 1300s. Remember the 1300s? That's when the Black Death swept Europe and killed millions and millions of people. Not a nice time. There was the Hundred Years' War in around there slightly later, but that wasn't nice either. <coughs> a lot of people died, towns got burned, the blood ran in the streets, and all that sort of thing. You know, there were, I mean, there were a lot of bad times after that, but it was constant striving for those things I was talking about. Control, predictability, certainty, and all that stuff. But the interesting thing about the Europeans at the time was that they believed that everything was imbued with life. Every tree, every rock, every place. And when you think about your Merlin, Merlin-esque figures, you think about King Arthur and all those people, you think about what they used to believe that every tree and every spring and every rock and every mountain had some sort of spiritual identity, had something real and alive about it. Well, they, they, they believed that. The world was filled for them full of demons and angels and spirits. There were more demons, angels, and spirits than there were people. And uh, uh, that's kind of interesting. I mean, everything that you read has to do with the fact that um, on the bench beside Annie, would be probably three or four demons, a couple on each side, maybe an angel or two. In her case, an angel or three. <laughs> but the thing is that, that this was common. People were encouraged to have their reality go well beyond what you could see and feel and touch. Because the closer um, the corporal, like the body, the physical form, was farthest away from God. And the spiritual was closest to God. And so you were constantly stri uh, striving to be part of that spiritual world. So this is, how they, this is how they thought. They were totally living in a world full of spirits and demons and non-corporal beings. They believed in all sorts of superstitious stuff that we long since would have, uh, uh, that we pretend not to believe it. But if you go to Ireland and France, and of course you go to all these places, there's still springs, and they still tie things up on there, and you know that this stuff still lives on. But the point is that we try very much to forget about it. Um, the, the landscape for them was very much alive. It was alive. They had that childlike sense of wonder. And I, I use that advisedly, except that I've watched kids, and I was over with a friend of mine who's, who's got a little daughter, and she was running around after the birds, you know, and she was, she was saying bird, bird, and she was doing all this stuff, and it was a wonderful thing to see. But in, in many respects, that's what the Europeans were like. Um, I don't want to oversimplify, but I want to make that point very, very clear. They were not what you'd call a super rational bunch of people. And one of the things that's happened over that thousand year period is we have almost given up everything to become as rational as we possibly could. So that's another thing about those people. Um, uh, I was really struck by uh, one thing I saw about um, uh, dragons. Um, that actually there, was, there were mountains in Europe that, were, uh, uh, that people knew to have dragons associated with them, even up and into the 1700s. And I'll bet you any money the people around there still believe it. One other thing that happened, and that you read all the time, is how fearful people were of the forests. The vast, trackless, dark forests filled with wolves and bears, filled with stags and uh, wild cattle, filled with brigands and thieves. People who would, you know, they would kill you as soon as you blink. Um, people were terrified of travel. They were terrified of the forest. They were terrified of big trees. All the big trees had spirits associated with them. Everything was alive and really weird. So all of those fears were embodied in people's minds. And, uh, and, and we have to be very much uh, mindful of that. Now, 
I was, when I was in France, I went to this really interesting place called Cluny, um, and it was one of the first great monasteries. But what happened was that the monastery was established as a way for the church to provide safety to travelers and knowledge. And they had mon uh, you know, monks and people went out all over Europe preaching Christianity, it's true, but also information and knowledge. And it's really interesting that when you look at uh, Cluny and the uh, monastic movement and feudalism and all these different things, all of these institutions developed in order to promote this order, control and knowledge and rationality and all that stuff. And first and foremost, perhaps, separation from the environment. What I'm setting the tone for here is not just the weirdness around the year 1000, but the roots of our own attitudes towards uh, the environment and a lot of the stuff that we do. Now, um, it's, it's kind of interesting to, uh, to, uh, to muse about our European brothers and sisters so long ago. But uh, one of the best ways to get a handle on the realities of these ideas is to look at our own literature. We all remember Margaret Abbott's book, of course, uh, Survival. That was her PhD thesis, and she published it. And everybody was shocked to realize that Canadians wrote about how terrified they were of the outdoors, how monstrous was the outdoors, and how scary the whole thing was. And in literature, in the minds of poets and writers and things like that, very often these latent, deep-seated fears come to the surface. But in literature as well, it wasn't just that scary stuff. Uh, we also had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, stories about uh, mastery of the wilderness, the camping ethic, perhaps, if you will, or the fur traders or uh, the lumber men who are out there cutting down the trees and things like that. Our literature, truly, it is filled with some of that fear and some of that uh, terror, but a lot of it is also filled with that mastery of the resource base, which is also so very important to, uh, to Canadians. So we look into our own literature in the historic past and we sort of see uh, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the kind of the tail ends of this, uh, this early European stuff. Now, we have this tendency to um, um, ignore the resource part of it, but resource extraction is a really important part of our psyche. Uh, we like the wilderness, we like to canoe out there and camp, and survive out there, it's true, and overcome those fears perhaps. But we, our, our entire economy and so much of our identity has had to do with this resource extraction, and that's, that's important as well. So as we kind of move into this environmental realm, it's very wise to remember that that's the, that, the reason why Canada is as, say, secure and solid as it is, has to do with a lot of the uh, resource extracts and stuff. Now, I had a very weird experience recently. Um, Mark was also involved. We were trying to develop a cost-benefit analysis approach to evaluating projects. On the one hand, we had our economists and various people who deal with resources, who could count things up and attribute a value to dollars, stuff like that, the usual stuff and substance of a cost-benefit study. And on the other hand, we had our biologists and ecologists and heritage conservation people like myself, who were uh, wrestling with an entirely different set of questions. And what came up for me was, um, what, is this, what is this prevailing value system that we have here? Like, what is, what, what is, what is the underlying um, resistance that we might have, say, to conservation and things like that? Um, it's a funny situation. We have a need to measure. As we have moved through this millennium, we have uh, honed our skills at measure. We have tried very, very hard to measure things so that we can communicate them precisely. If we can't measure them, often they're not there. Like they have no purpose, they have no sense or use. We need to measure, we need to measure so we can communicate, we need to measure so we can communicate and use, and if we can't measure it, we don't care about it. So it's an interesting kind of little thing, but um, the what's good, or what good is it um, ethic is, 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 is kind of peculiar because in fact, um, it's all human oriented. We really never consider elements within the environment for their own sake. We don't answer questions, uh, say, like, what good is it, which we get all the time, 
like how many arrowheads do you need, or how many wetlands do you need to preserve, um, like the answer could just as well be, well, none of your business. I mean, it's, it's good, it's neat, it's fine. I mean, don't ask that question, it's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant to the economically minded people. It's not irrelevant to the prevailing um, uh, model builders in our society. But when you get right down to it, the answer to the question, there is no answer to the question. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. There are a whole realm of things out there that you can't answer questions about. And consequently, because you can't answer questions about them, they're set aside. And they're outside the realm of consideration. And this is a serious issue. Now, we get into this all the time, we who perhaps are operating on the conservation side of things, because we're constantly trying to frame the importance of a resource in economic or measurable terms. And in a funny kind of a way, we are, we're, we're playing along with the, let's see, what would I say? Um, by entering into that game, we are more or less objectifying the environment as well and putting it at arm's length from us and saying, well, we're not a part of it. So almost everything that we do in our society removes us and separates us from the environment. And it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of peculiar. It's very, very difficult to get away from that. We're all geared towards benefit and impact and all that sort of thing. And it's all human-oriented. Now, um, I think that this just reinforces the whole idea about we're not really part of nature. And uh, there's a, there are other ethics. Uh, you know, we, we started going through as part of this exercise. We're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to identify the value system that um, uh, the value systems and the elements within the value system that kind of lead us to uh, act the way that we do. Another one is highest and best use. Um, that's a legal term. That's a term that shows up in the development uh, business all the time. We always say, well, the highest and best use here is the activity or the use that returns the highest amount of money to the individual that owns the land. Now, gradually we're moving away from some of these things. There are a few glimmers of hope. For example, the spotted owl, owl habitat out west was preserved for its own sake because of the spotted owls. And Ruth Greer was quoted as saying that the best use for the land along the waterfront was a, some sort of waterfront trail. And uh, so there is a shift away from these prevailing values, but they're very, very deep. They're in government at all levels. They're in business at all levels. They're taught in the schools at all levels. Planning departments, when they're training planners, teach those values. So they're very, very deep. And we, uh, we have to work uh, fairly hard to uh, understand them and perhaps try to change them. There is this nagging feeling, however, that there's something seriously the matter. And it contributes to the whole anxiety that we're experiencing these days. Um, I'm not saying that everybody goes around uh, with this longing for a childlike sense of reconnection with, the, uh, with nature, but uh, a lot of people are talking about that. A lot of people are desperately trying to find out whether or not their life is lacking in meaning or whether there's a way to get more meaning out of life or whether they can develop some activities or pastimes that are more interesting than what they do. So this has led, I think, along with a lot of other things, to an ecological approach I mean, people trying to develop some sort of an ecological approach to, uh, to, to, uh, to planning. Now, when I, I put into the title the concepts about uh, uh, habitat, community, and landscape, or community, habitat, and landscape, those, those concepts make me very nervous. Now, maybe I'm just a nervous kind of guy, I don't know. But um, they're gaining a lot of currency these days, just like ecological planning is gaining a lot of currency. And the conservation of biodiversity is gaining a lot of uh, uh, currency as well. But all these terms make me nervous. Because when it comes to actually implementing them, um, you got a real problem. you got a real problem because you can't measure these things very often. You can't define them. You can't draw them on maps. Very, very interesting problem. Because I believe that we're, there's, a, there's a rising sense of, what would you say, almost critical mass that suggests that we have to become ecological planners. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that's, uh, that's okay, but what is the whole system? How do you identify all of the different parts of a whole system among which you have to find interrelationships? How do you measure those interrelationships as to how significant they are? 
How do we do these things? Um, everything changes. Like our minds change, our attitudes change, the landscape and the environment change. Everything is dynamic. It's always changing itself. It's changing in, in relationship to other things. How do we deal with that, uh, that dynamism? Um, what is the carrying capacity of a piece of property? Like, what is the carrying capacity of a system? How do we deal with these things? Um, sustainability, I don't even have to comment on. I mean, you all know how difficult that is. What is sustainability? What, is, what, is, uh, what does that uh, really mean? Um, another thing we're wrestling with, and that gets into the community habitat and landscape thing, is what is a natural geographic unit? Now, um, I, 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 brought, uh, I brought this thing in here because I just wanted you to know that there are a lot of people trying to develop a hand, handles on these, these issues. I mean, for those of you who work in a municipal system or in a conservation authority system, you know about the watershed planning guidelines. Well, there are a lot of guidelines out there. There's a lot of guidelines and a lot of people trying to come to terms with what these things mean. But I don't know if you've ever worked with these guidelines, but they're very, very elusive. Very elusive. Now, I want to get back to that idea about a guideline in a moment. But the, uh, um, the ecological planning uh, approach suggests that we measure we measure success by the quality of the results and I, 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 I believe in all of these things I believe implicitly and very deeply in all of these things and I'm a big supporter of ecological planning and yet it makes me nervous because I don't exactly know what these things mean and uh, when you get into uh, other things like for example why um, what, the reason why we can't accomplish anything now is because of jurisdictional gridlock. Um, I believe that everybody has the best will in the world. I believe that developers do. I believe that, I mean, for, generally speaking, you know, the 99% of the people around are as good as they can be. And they're all working, generally speaking, for, towards good ends. And I think that's true of people in planning and in municipal government provincial, federal, all the way up. And yet, it's amazing to feel and experience this gridlock, this inability of people to communicate with one another from office to office, or vertically, or from government to government. And what's almost amazing is if you're in a municipality, you stop at the boundary of the municipality, your, uh, your interests, you don't have time to care about what happens on the other side of that border. It's very, very strange. We're aware of this, and yet our lives are so complicated that we just can't get around to doing that. So this is a very interesting problem, and we're right in the middle of jurisdictional gridlock. We have a terrible time at all levels of government. So that's another issue that kind of, first of all, the definition of terms is kind of elusive, and we're in the midst of a governmental system that is just not functioning, and it's, it's, it's a real problem. Now, I know that, that uh, nothing I say is going to uh, change this. I also know that every town and every city, every municipality functions in their own way. They have their own culture, they have their own history and traditions and stuff like that. They have their own Reeves and Reeves families and Reeves brothers-in-law who owns the road grader and the gravel pit. And everybody's got their own system. Everybody's got their own sense of community. Um, I, I just threw that word in there just to sort of try to see whether or not it made more sense now than it did a couple of minutes ago. But community is also a very, very interesting word. We'll get around to it a little bit more. But um, we're being asked, I suppose, as people working in the planning area, to integrate our budgets, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deal with natural boundaries rather than political boundaries and traditional jurisdictional boundaries and all that sort of thing. And it's a, it's a, it's a very very difficult bunch of things to do. Now, let's, let's just deal for a moment with some of these, uh, these concepts. What is a community? Now, I, I know I haven't given you um, much chance to sort of take part in this uh, so far, but um, um, I have a real problem with the idea of community. Maybe I'm just having a bad day. Is that possible? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 uh, I love the idea of community. I love being part of a community in a neighborhood. Um, 
I believe that communities function as well as they possibly can, but what are they? And how do you define a community? For example, um, it's a biological term. It has to do with a grouping of species who happen to live in roughly the same place. And uh, uh, it doesn't even usually have much to do with other species that are in the same place as a biological uh, term. So basically, the way we might use community in a human sense is all the people who happen to live in a particular place. But it doesn't include the streets and the trees and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it doesn't include all the complexities. It's not a very ecological term, even though it sounds like it is. Um, and yet, we're supposed to be aware of communities. We're supposed to go in and find out what communities are and how they function. And so that's, that's, a, that's a, pretty interesting, uh, it's a pretty interesting challenge. Uh, we're, we, we struggle with that. We go in and we have focus groups and stuff like that. We try and get a hand on it. But in general, it's a very, very elusive term. And it's almost impossible to plan with it, to do land use planning around that term. Habitat's another one. Um, what is habitat? Um, Canada, well, you see, Canada's country. Ontario, well, it's a political unit. The Great Lakes, that's getting closer to it. It's kind of like a habitat. Um, habitat, again, is a biological term, and it has to do with the place within which a community lives. The place which provides all the, net, the, the normal sustenance for that particular community. The, the, uh, the resource base that supports individuals and creatures and uh, the uh, members of the community, the habitat. Um, we talk a lot about habitat, pre uh, protecting habitat, identifying habitat, evaluating and protecting habitat. And yet that's a very, very elusive thing too, because one habitat houses many, many, many different species. And generally speaking, the way we use the term is we factor human beings out of that. Because habitat is for animals and bugs and critters of all sorts and stuff like that, but not people. Um, what is a human habitat? Well, as I say, it's often a jurisdictional area, the Great Lakes, maybe Ontario, maybe the city of Toronto. But is that really a habitat? Like, what do we mean by that term? And yet, it's being used increasingly in, uh, in, uh, planning, uh, in planning circles. Now, landscape is another one. I mentioned before at the outset that I love the idea of landscape, and I love to work with it. And a landscape includes habitat. It includes many, many uh, communities. Landscape is a very, very interesting term. But what is a landscape? Can you draw a boundary around a landscape? How does a landscape function? One thing that I've become convinced of over the years is that um, most of the things that are of heritage significance they don't exist in the past, we know that, because the past is gone. They exist in our minds. So we stand there and we look at something and we perceive it. It comes into our heads and it functions. So a landscape can function by being perceived by people. So that means it doesn't have to be any larger than what you can see. But how do you plan that? How do you draw a boundary around that? Because when you walk up the road, or you drive over to the next knoll, and you look back, you see a different landscape. Or is a landscape a whole collection of things that are within a, a particular habitat zone? I don't know. And does a habitat, or does a landscape, sorry, function when you're not there? Like a landscape, traditionally, is something that you see. But if you're not there, is it still a landscape? Now, in a planning sense, we're constantly being asked to um, uh, talk about form and function. How do things work? What, how are they put together? How are they built? How are, the, how are the individual pieces sort of interrelated with one another? And how does it function? Well, that's a really elusive thing too, like form and function. And I think that we have a lot of work to do on the whole functional side of things. Like, what is its design? How does it function? Do we mean functioning in an ecological sense? Do we mean functioning in an aesthetic sense? It, 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 it's very, very elusive. So we've got all these terms that we're using. And, uh, and I think one of the big problems, going back to um, our early days in planning, there was a, a, a 
quite an active school, a land use planning school in uh, Chicago. And they got into regression analysis and they figured out that they could probably, you know, figure out just about everything about a city. And they were using all sorts of variables and then over the years, it, uh, all the variables sort of shrank down because people realized that they couldn't really, um, they actually couldn't really define any of these variables. And that's a real problem. Now, I, I am not, I am not pessimistic. I am not, in fact, pessimistic. But I'm really quite puzzled about what we're supposed to do with this. And I think that it's going to require, you know, the very, very best that people have to offer in order to make some of this stuff work. Because it is very, very important. It's extremely important. Now, um, we've been working on the, you know, sets of guidelines. And I, I believe that, um, um, now, let, me, let me put this uh, as uh, carefully as I can. Um, we all want people to do the right thing. Um, it's strange, though, that at the end of um, how long now? We've had an Environmental Assessment Act uh, since 1975. We've had a planning act since, well, there was a previous planning act, 83 and stuff like that. We've got sort of about 20 years of trying these things out and working really, really hard to get them working up and functioning and whatnot. And we've uh, worked very hard with the development community and various other people that uh, um, uh, affect the landscape. And we have, as government people, created a whole lot of guidelines to help them do it. Um, and the funny thing about it is that these guidelines are all out there now at a time when governments don't have any money. The economy is, is in, 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 in rather serious shape. Uh, people, uh, generally speaking, can't afford to do the studies that are necessary in order to follow the guidelines. And um, um, it's a very strange situation. I see all over the place people, um, say in timber management or other uh, different resource extraction areas, saying, well, you know, I can't really afford to do all this environmental assessment. And these are good people. These are people who, with the very best will in the world, can't do it. They don't have the markets to support this stuff. And we're in a very, very strange situation here because we have got all the guidelines we need now and people can't afford to do the stuff that they need to do. Um, anyway, all this is contributing to anxiety and nervousness and whatever else that uh, uh, people are experiencing. The uh, economy is in a mess and uh, everybody has all these guidelines to follow and nobody has any money. And uh, governments are getting smaller and smaller. And there isn't anybody out there to make sure that people follow guidelines anyway. Um, now, when I've been talking to the development uh, community and people uh, in uh, the resource extraction industry, most of them, if not all of them, believe really strongly in environmental values. And they want to do the right thing. And it's, it's, it's a very strange situation. A critical mass has been created. All these people are watching David Suzuki. I think, generally speaking, there's been a huge shift in values, or at least it started. Um, I think that almost the last bastion of the old way of looking at things is in government. People out there are saying, look, everybody else understands what's important and what has to be done. Why doesn't government understand? Well, that's part of the gridlock thing. So I think we have here uh, a population that's very sensitive to these issues. I think we have um, uh, uh, sort of a private sector that's very sensitive and very willing to do all this stuff. Um, we have a lot of terms that are very difficult to uh, define. We've got a lot of guidelines that may not be followed. And uh, it's a very peculiar situation. Now, I wish I had some answers. I wish I could tell you exactly what's going to happen over the next little while. But I think that as we move into the new millennium, I think that things are going to be very, very different from what, they, what we think they are going to be. I think that what's going to happen is that people are going to do what works. And I think that that's very, very uh, uh, different from what we're trying to do now. What we want as government people, people to do, what we want people to do, is we want them to follow guidelines because we've worked these things out. But what's actually going to happen is that people are going to do what works. 
and maybe that's a good thing. Now, um, the, uh, the main thing here, I think, is that we are aware of these problems and all that sort of stuff. Mostly what's happening is that people's roles are changing. Um, I, and, and I see a lot of evidence of this. People, um, people in general, whether they're teachers or developers or um, resource extraction people, people in the private sector, in the manufacturing businesses and all this sort of thing, everybody is sort of feeling like they're being misunderstood. And I think that, I think that the roles are changing, even in the planning area, for those of you who are planners. Um, Planners have tended traditionally to be in the background. They have collected data, they've written reports, they've made recommendations, they have uh, worked behind the scenes. They haven't really been in a position to make decisions. They've tried to influence if possible. But even planners are going to have to step out and take, in, take on a new role. They're going to have to become much more educators. They're going to have to explain what community means. They're going to have to explain what landscape means. They're going to have to explain how to follow guidelines. Because it's not enough to write them. You've got to explain how they're supposed to be used, or they're not going to get used. Developers are going to have to explain why they're doing what they do. Because a lot of them do neat things. A lot of them want to do creative things, but they run smack dab into a bunch of guidelines. And their guidelines sometimes are really stupid. Like they just don't work. And we hear all the time about subdivisions that are supposed to be really creative, but they're not going to work because, well, there's the fire code and there's the traffic stuff and the roads have to be 66 feet wide and all that sort of stuff. And that's a real problem. Developers are trying to be creative too. In the uh, resource extraction industry, I've been talking to people who are out there cutting trees in a pretty sensitive kind of a way. They're trying to figure out the best thing to do. They're working with the best will in the world. They're communicating, but they've got to do a lot more of that. People building pipelines, for example. I mean, when you get on a plane to go to Mexico, or France in my case, or whatever, that fuel that you're, that's uh, in the plane is coming all the way from Sarnia along a pipeline uh, that was built by uh, uh, Imperial Oil. And, um, and uh, it's really neat. It's part of the invisible infrastructure that's out there, just like the water pipes that are coming into your house and the electrical wires and hydro lines and all that stuff is really interesting. Why don't we celebrate that? Very strange. We don't celebrate that. And I believe that part of the changing roles is going to be that people are going to have to tell somebody about what they do. They're going to have to talk about the hydro, talk about the pipeline, talk about the highway, talk about why it's good and receive the feedback that's necessary in order to kind of you know, shape it. I think that people are going to have to talk a lot more, and I hope that they uh, do. I hope that they start doing that. Um, everybody has to reach across the fence that kind of constricts them now, walk into the next office. But whatever it is that you have to do, you have to reach out and generate some amount of respect for what you do, and be open to the fact that you have to have respect for what somebody else is doing as well. Now, I think that, I think that when people came to North America from Europe, after the long period of time of the Enlightenment and education and all that sort of stuff that happened, they came here with a lot of the fears, a lot of the fears that led them to cut down trees and and you know, completely eradicate all sorts of different things. They came with those fears. They came with a fierce sort of sense about the resource base that was here that could be exploited. And they came with um, a lot of hope and a lot of promise. You see that all the time in the literature that you read. You, uh, you read it all the time in the historical documentation. What they seem to have lost, perhaps, was that sense of magic, that sense of joy about the place that maybe was a lot more prevalent amongst their European ancestors. And I think what, which was fairly prevalent amongst the native people who were here, who could only be treated with scorn because they were so like the ancestors of these same people who were coming to North America. I believe that in working with one another and in reducing that antagonism and in reaching out and communicating and in showing respect and being respected in turn, 
I think that there's an awful lot that's going to come out of it. And, it, and that's what I mean by we're going to have to do what works. We're going to have to, in fact, and I hate to say this because I, 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 I guess that, I mean, I don't want to be quoted, but I mean, what the heck. Um, You're being taped. <laughs> we, are, we are almost guideline to death, and we don't have the resources to do this stuff. But everybody wants to do the right thing. So we're going to have to find out ways to make it work. And we're going to have to find out ways to make it work so nobody gets hurt. So nothing gets hurt. The place doesn't get diminished. Our environment gets enhanced. But we're going to have to find out ways to make it work. And we do that by talking to one another. Now, if you've got any insights at all into what landscape, habitat, and community are, I'd be really happy to hear that. Because I have to go to work tomorrow and figure those things out. And I think maybe some of you do too. And any assistance would be great, grateful to receive. But uh, in the meantime, we'll reach out and communicate and play a new role. Play the role of educator. And, um, and I believe it's going to work for us. And I think somehow or another we can lower this anxiety that everybody's feeling. Because everybody is really freaked out. Now that's basically more or less all I wanted to say. And it more or less corresponds to what it is that I wrote down. Um, if there's any questions at all, I can't imagine how you could ask any questions about any of that stuff. <laughs> um, if there are any questions, please um, ask them. Um, or if you have any ideas about those uh, other things that we have to hear about. I guess these casinos must be uh, one of the things to fill the void of the little uh, uh, elves and uh, wood uh, whistles. Uh, wood whistles, yes. Elves, I don't know. Um, I, I sort of think, to tell you the truth, I think the casino issue is sort of like smoke and mirrors. Hmm. Like things are so screwed up right now, let's have a casino. Uh, maybe we can make some money. I mean, those guys in Montreal have made quite a bit. Yeah. Well, you, oh, sorry. Go, go well, there's that sense of. Uh, Oh, well, you know what? It's filling that void. No, no, it's filling that void. And maybe that's an example of just doing some, let's see if it works. <laughs> let's see if it works. <clears throat> because believe me, I am an optimistic person. And, and I, I believe that people are going to find a way for things to work. Uh, you know, the question may come. Um, do you think that we're going through another sort of renaissance? Um, not yet. <laughs> no, I don't think that. I don't think that. I think that, uh, remember what the Renaissance was? It was um, um, after the, um, um, you know, the Dark Ages, and after the rest of the medieval period, which is when, you know, the Normans, Norman invasion, and all the cathedrals, and all that sort of wild stuff was going on. There was a rediscovery of the Roman uh, and the Greek teachings, sort of in, in Italy, and uh, uh, it sort of evolved and went all over Europe after that. I guess it actually started in the Middle East. But, uh, and it came, as a matter of fact, from an awful lot of Islamic writers uh, that were in Spain. Well, it's, you know what I mean. Uh, but the thing is that uh, um, that was what it was all about. A rediscovery of early um, thinkings. Now, I don't know if it was such a good thing, really. Just like I don't think the Enlightenment was all that good either. Because, I mean, it's the thing that separated us to a large extent from, from nature. I mean, we went right into our heads. And as a, like, I'm a wasp. And they're the worst for that sort of thing. Like, you know, all in your head, you know. So um, I, I, I look back on those people and I think, gee whiz, you know, gosh. You know, at least I could have been a Catholic or something, you know, but I wasn't. <laughs> anyway, so no, I don't think it's a renaissance yet. We may be coming to that maybe in about 2020. The time period's tend to get no present. <laughs> yeah. I think... I think I'm not a planner. I think I may have some insight in the problem with guidelines. Yeah. I think they're okay, I mean, for the most part. Some of them are crazy. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the people who develop them have done it with you know, good common sense, and for the most part, they're probably good guidelines. I think the problem is that the people who are expected to follow them have not been given the education that you mentioned. And I think they're generally afraid of them, or let's say a developer or these crazy guidelines, because they don't understand them. 
I know you have more, I'm assuming you have more experience than I have. I've written but, a bunch of them and I still don't understand. Well, with some of them are probably understandable, but I think the problem lies that the people who are supposed to follow them really don't understand them. I, and I give you credit for your wonderful optimism for saying everyone is of goodwill. And I, I think that's great. I, I think I may be more cynical. And, I, and also, let's say, someone who's trying to follow guidelines that you may have written may not have had the benefit of your historical perspective or, or your environmental ethic. Or the whole. They may want to, but they may not quite be there yet. So they may not really be able to understand what the guidelines are getting at. Uh, but what I really think the problem is, is that, and I don't mean you, but the people who are in a position to make sure those guidelines are applied are not doing it. They're hiding behind them, and they're keeping them in their drawer. And they're not pulling them out all the time. And they're expecting people, people generally know they're supposed to follow them. But sometimes the guidelines are pulled out, and sometimes <coughs> they're not. Yeah. So there's no, they're not applied fairly across the board, and everybody doesn't know the situation. You know, maybe you'll be in some region where the person in charge, some director somewhere, is going to say, you guys have to follow these guidelines. Some other place, maybe that doesn't happen. So I think it's sort of misunderstanding and uncertainty about the applications. And I understand the bureaucracy not wanting to pull them out because they want things to move, they want the economy to pick up and so on. But I really think you know, more of an education in terms of the guidelines is what I see. I, I would be fair. Thank you very much for that comment because I think you really nailed a couple of very important things. And, uh, and I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Part of the reason why people aren't right there educating is that they've got time to write them and they've got time to process all the paper that comes in as a result of them, but they don't have time to go out and explain them. And, and that's part of the whole idea, the weird role that government has placed itself in, which may well redress itself as the resources get cut. But good points, good points, thank you. I, I have another point on something else. Sure. See here, encourage me. <laughs> the, um, all right, and this may be difficult. I don't want to insult a whole bunch of people here. Um, problem in planning is, I, as I see it, is plan trying to apply the qualification to it, or, or the scientific aspect of it. Where What you're really talking about, and the way you talk tonight, is sort of from the soul and our connection with nature and how people in a community feel about what's around them, how they want it to be. When you try and create a model or qualify that somehow, I, I, I think that may be the problem. And it's, I'm sure it's something you're wrestling with every day, is how do you translate the, the human emotion part of it into something on paper mm -hmm. and something that you can apply everywhere because that doesn't work because people have different concepts. And again, everybody's not at the same place. Um, where they, you know, people may generally, generally have the idea they don't want to get sick from drinking the water from Lake Ontario. To make the leap from something to matter with your drinking water to storm water management that some developer is going to charge you more money for something. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a huge leap that people aren't able to make. And it's something that I'm not convinced that all planners are able to make. Because, and again, I compliment you on the good feelings you got about people's goodwill. But again, everyone has to change their attitude and get to the same place that the environmental people are at. There's, as I see it, there's one stream of people who are ahead in their consciousness. Then there's a bunch of people who want to be there and who have the, the background, the professional background. But until, until it's a change in their their way of being, they're not going to be able to do it. And I think that's the problem now, too, with planning and trying to figure out how to do it. Thank you. <coughs> yes, okay. Um, I just wanted to throw in something about historical context. Um, from an example that I ran into here in Mississauga, most, a lot of people, when I talk to them, are very new to Mississauga. We've gone through a very drastic growth 
and then people think that the Soviet was sort of invented 20 years ago mm -hmm. because it is 20 years old in terms of being called it numbers. And sometimes what you see around you doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of why things are the way they are in terms of structure, the way the city's been structured. Because often people don't have a historical context to how that happened. And this personally happened with me. I lived on the street in a subdivision here in Mississauga. And I was very annoyed that I couldn't access a park, that they hadn't put um, uh, a right of way through to this park. Now, the context is I'd only lived in that subdivision for two years. Okay. So to me, the planning was, they screwed it up. Mm -hmm. I had to walk my dog like six blocks to find an access to a park that was on the opposite side of the street from me, but they had a row of houses in between. It was only in talking to our neighbor, who had lived there for 30 years, that I came to understand that when the subdivision was built, that was an outboard. There was no plan to access it through a right way because it wasn't intended for a park. Planning of the park came afterwards after the houses had been built, and after there was no access to, or right away there, that they put a park in, and that the access was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That was helpful, because the historical context made sense of the community I was living in for that moment. And I no longer was angry about the fact that I, no longer, I didn't have a, a right of way to this park. Yeah. But I find people, in addition to the anxiety, are often confused about their environments now as to why they are the way they are, because often there isn't a historical context. It's not like we are living in the villages and towns that we've grown up in. We're usually transplanted now to another community, to another town, to another village. Mm -hmm. And we frequently don't understand why they are the way they are. Mm -hmm. So part of what I feel that my organization is about is trying to help people understand the context of the communities. I think that's very, it's dead, dead right. Yeah, that's really important. I, I, I was talking to some guys uh, in this little town in France, um, Clooney. Uh, they were standing on a, on a, on a, in a street with an arch that was probably built, I don't know, in 500 AD or something like that. All these houses were probably, they called them Roman houses, so I don't know what that means. Um, and they had this huge piece of granite. There was a, a piece of granite this high and they were sawing uh, a kind of an angle on it, you know, like a miter, a corner. And I said, you know, what is this thing that you're doing? And they said, we are, we are repairing our kitchen. Now, a piece of granite like that, we buy whatever you call that stuff, you know, that looks like granite. You know, it's a molded kind of a counter, and you fire it in the kitchen because you know you're not going to be there in five years. These guys were sawing this thing, and it was about two inches thick. And they were, they were installing something that was replacing a countertop that was probably installed about a thousand years before. And they wanted it to last another thousand years. And it's a different attitude. You don't ask people in those towns where they're from. I mean, of course they're from there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I've enjoyed this so much. I, I hate to have a negative aspect to any of it. But I think if we're going to progress, we have to be very honest about yes. these things. And by the way, if you ever want to give history lessons, I'll sign up. <laughs> Some of the things you said, I would love to be as optimistic as you. And possibly because of your position, maybe when people see you or talk to you, yeah. they say that they're very sensitive to the problems. You know, I'm not sure they're telling the truth. You said the public and private sector were very sensitive to guidelines and solutions. I'm sorry. I, I am lucky enough to know some wonderful people in public life who are sensitive and, um, you know, in the private sector. But I don't believe that most of them, particularly in the private se sector, are sensitive. I think what they're sensitive to is possibly appearing to be <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> um, and also, they're very sensitive to what's the easiest and what <coughs> will make them the most money. I, I really believe that. And one other comment, you said that we, we, we all have to talk, and you gave an example of hydro. And I don't want to pick on hydro here, but it's a whole other Both of mine. It's a whole other side. <laughs> <laughs> but just as an example, you said that hydro have to communicate, and, and that's fine. 
The last time I heard a communication from Hydro, I left three feet off the ground. I was so annoyed because what they had told was not the truth, and I knew this. They were actually talking about their nuclear power plants and all that. I knew it wasn't the truth. So I think the message has to go out very clearly that if we are going to communicate and learn, we have to do it with a great deal of honesty. And I, and I think we've lost that. People, when, when they do educate, not present company accepted, by the way, but a lot of people, when they educate in the broad term, what they really want to do is pe put their best foot forward, appear themselves to be doing the best. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what we need. I think we need the truth. I've covered a lot of broad territory. I'm sorry, but uh, no, don't apologize. I think that telling the truth uh, should never be apologized for. Um, I won't uh, agree or disagree with you. I mean, I've been working with hydro for years and years and years, and whether uh, uh, and I know that what you say is true. However, um, I still like to say what I said because uh, somehow or another. Um, I know that when hydro screws up big time, years and years and years, God destroys them. And that's basically what's happening now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the lights are still going on when we flip the switch and stuff like that, but these things have a way of balancing out. And uh, I believe that the reason why hydro is in the state they're in is because the people in Ontario said, wait a minute, too many of us have been lied to, mm -hmm. and this is our solution. Like, these things have a way of working. You know, um, and, and I take what you say. I don't want to push that too far. Um, a lot of things, some of the things I say sometimes, I, I want to just kind of try out and see how they sound. Um, but I, I take your point. It's, it's, it's true. Um, there are people out there, and yet every year that goes by, those they have kids. Those kids go to school. The kids come home and bug them about smoking cigarettes, or they bug them about. Um, uh, uh, what do you call it, out in the backyard, composting, um, recycling. Like, there are people next door to me who, not only do, do they not have a composter in their backyard, which they could buy for 15 bucks if they wanted to, but they don't even recycle their bottles. Like, and you sort of think, holy mackerel, mm -hmm. like this is 1994, but they still don't, you know, and there's about six of them. Big people you know, in this house, and I think, God, <laughs> just think of all the compost that they would generate. <laughs> 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 well, they are. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I think it's phenomenal. Uh, I think one of the most phenomenal things is when I'm in my car and drive to work on garbage day, and I see all these blue boxes lying in the street. I just think it's phenomenal that the people have gone and speak. Yes. I yes. mean, to have mm -hmm. every one of those people walk a block mm -hmm. to, to the doorstep mm -hmm. after having spent a week of collecting this stuff and putting it in that box, I think it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing that fuels my optimism. You know, because on the one hand, you have a bad game, and you think, my God, you know, um, you know, lightning should strike the Ministry of Natural Resources. And on the, at the next day, something really neat happens, and you think, wow, I guess we're going to be okay. Like Mark and I are in this really, um, we are involved in a really interesting project that on the one hand can be really depressing, and on the other hand, we're trying to figure out how to go into the communities. Because, you know, with, with the Sewell Report and with the new Planning Act that's going to be coming out and all the stuff that's happening, there are going to be some profound and fundamental changes to land use planning, because the, the, the approvals are going to jump right down to the municipal level. And you, you, we're going to be standing here with our little guidelines here going like this. Hey, wait a minute. You know, they're going to be looking at us like saying, you've got no jurisdiction over me. You know? And we, I don't care what you say. So we're hoping, you see. I mean, that's where the education thing comes in. Um, you know, speaking to people at the municipal level and making sure they've got the will, at least, you know, and eventually the expertise. Sir, you're expecting a vigilant public, however, to have knowledge of these guidelines and raise hell when they're not being applied. It's happening. It's happening. Well, your vigilant public doesn't encompass a lot of educated people. And, and, and the vigilant public is scrambling around asking all kinds of questions. Perhaps. And tragically enough, the vigilant public is as often as not the same people at this hearing and at this meeting mm -hmm. 
and involved in this project and they burn out. And yet, every year that goes by, there are more and more people involved. And that's a good thing too. I, I, I agree with you 100%, but you know, there, there's, there, it's happening. There is a, there is a, there is a, a, a critical mass building that's making, that's creating a shift. One other point I'd make, you, you spoke of the anxiety. Yeah. Uh, perhaps the greatest anxiety is among government employees <laughs> uh, who, I, 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 can, I can recall my great leader at one time saying, well, we can't, change, we, we can't acknowledge we made a mistake because we're like stupid. Okay? And his boss, seven layers up, are all the flat answers you get on some occasion, says, don't make bad press or I'll come down and change the stock. Okay, this was about 10 years. And, and you know, this is what I see. It's a tremendous anxiety on the part of say, your junior planners and media planners because if they bring the guideline and said, hey, boss, we can't do that, then the leader of magnitude up in the council chamber here says, another goddamn study? We're not going to pay for another study. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of anxiety in government, but there's a lot in business, too. Uh, throughout all the sectors. Um, yeah. How, how do you deal with um, the attitude that is still prevalent that tries to dominate the landscape <clears throat> and the environment and that the man the man made um, infrastructure that has to be put in place to to totally dominate and destroy the natural environment? How do you deal with those attitudes that aren't changing? You know, it's interesting. Um, using, looking at the medieval situation in a funny kind of a way, uh, dominance of the landscape has to do with power. And uh, in the old days, uh, people would build the churches and the key government buildings on the highest hill. And you still see, even as recently as, say, in Coburg, you know, with its Victoria College, like your universities, your, your churches, and your uh, government fellows, whether a palace or a castle or whatever it happens to be. And that was a, a statement about power. It was as much a statement about power over the landscape as it is over the people in the landscape. And that's what it's all about. So what you've got is... Um, <laughs> So, so what you have then is uh, um, there's some, been some interesting studies done about city cores and stuff like that. And as the ecclesiastical power diminished, the churches, unless they were already there, stopped being you know placed in the dominant position. And you had your basically Mies van der Rohe, Toronto Dominion Bank type, or whatever. And then there's been this resurgence um, of, of things in a, a basically a neutral landscape, which is a farm, farm fields, you know, relatively flat and stuff like that. Where somebody said, uh, and Mel Lassner was similar too. I don't know whether Hazel decided to do this or not, or who decided, but uh, that's an example of, of power. Power, just the rawest form of power. You know? <laughs> but they're always trying to make history, the tower, the. Well, they're trying to do postmodern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know that, but, the, <laughs> but, but it is about power. So the, your question is um, will the expression of power change? I'm always there's going to be power. Always they're going to, there's going to be the expression of ego. And I mean, in a funny kind of a way, although it might irritate you very much, um, there will always be people trying to express power. And it, to, a, to a, a degree so far beyond our imagining, like even now, right now in the world, there are people who are so powerful that we don't even know that they exist. So, I mean, um, this is a fairly minor expression of power, but I'll bet you those people that I'm talking about, the people who kind of control the, the, per, the gnomes of Zurich, or whatever you want to call them, um, they don't build buildings like this. In Mississauga, that, that is not the symbol of power. In Mississauga, the eight and 10 and 12 lane highways that run through the city are the symbol of power. And how do we stop that symbol, which is related to the 20th century, 21st century, the automobile. Uh, how do we stop it from totally destroying the natural environment that exists? Because they go through them all. Yes. And um, 
that's very minor compared to the 12 lane highways that go through the city. Okay, so we've got a highway coming up now called 407, or 407, <coughs> 407 is, is, is punching right through the heart of you know the area north of 401. And it's designed to go all the way to Peterborough. And uh, it's the brainchild of a whole group of engineers and planners and whatever in MTO. And it's an expression of provincial power. And, uh, and they're in the process of building it right now. And it doesn't need to go up there. And I believe that public attitudes about automobiles are changing. I mean, the, the number of, I mean, I, I, I think they are. I, I, it can be argued and debated and all that sort of stuff. But I really think that people's attitudes towards cars are changing. They're getting smaller. They're much more efficient, cost effective, and all that sort of stuff. They take up a smaller amount of the roadway. And the idea about 407 is just absurd. Everybody knows that. So at what point does that thing actually become operational, where everybody knows it, and they don't go 407? That, that's what I'm interested in. And, and uh, in our, in our uh, project, as we sort of work our way out you know, east of here, there's a stirring and a growing discontent about the whole idea about the 407 going up there along the Oak Ridges Moraine, mm -hmm. and the Newcastle Ajax interchange, you know, boom, between 401. People are saying, no, I don't think so. You know, I'm going to try and find out a way just kind of, I don't like that very much. And they're trying to, get, they're going to find a way. They're going to find a way. The answer you get uh, is, oh, that was planned 25 years ago. And we bought the land, we got all the easements. And you say, oh, geez, what are they planning today that 25 right. years from now will say, uh, they're probably planning the, the bypass for the 407. Yeah. Uh, because they said, well, 25 years from now. And you'll have all these bypasses going all over James Bay. Think about the <laughs> millions of dollars that, it's, that they could save by not building that highway. Amazing, eh? Well, Peter, wouldn't you think one of the ways to get off the road infrastructure kick? I wonder for planners to try to illustrate if there's other kinds of uh, infrastructure that need attending to, like our waste infrastructure and our sewer and water. And I don't even mean those pipes. I mean independent systems that are community-based. Somebody could try and cross the boundaries, as you're saying, and, and, and start to speak out about those other infrastructures that seem to have missed the bandwagon and the present funding uh, uh, extravaganza of the federal government for the roads. I wonder, you know, there's other infrastructures, or, uh, lots of other infrastructures, it seems. You know, someone could begin to illustrate that. We have an example of something, coming back to infrastructures that are, there, there is some kind of guidelines around the collection of waste and collection of garbage. And I, I don't know, but I remember reading something recently in the paper that interested me. There was a community who decided what they were going to do. If they were going to encourage people to take things that they didn't want out to their curbside on a certain day, and then other people would go through the garbage. Mm -hmm. Now this is a restrict. This is restricted. You're not supposed to do this. This was not considered lawful. They did do it. Yeah, but so but they were given permission to do it here, as on the condition that they remove all of this garbage from the curb stop by <laughs> by by the end of the day or whatever. If it, well, hadn't, if it hadn't been removed yes. by your neighbor mm -hmm. um, or yeah. or put into properly disposed of in terms of garbage. But I thought it was an example of what you were saying about people will find ways that will work. Often what happens though is they run into the regulations. And an example of this, going back to the waste management side of things again, is that um, my father-in-law has to take his garbage to a public dump, at which place people are throwing out all kinds of things that are a lot of which are still useful. Mm -hmm. and people would want. But unfortunately, if they cross that boundary line into this dump, even if they're just on the other side, you can't access them, or you're, you're legally breaking the law. So he will stand on this side of the line and grab people before they can enter into the dump, because he is of that generation that you didn't throw things away, especially useful things. He has no need for bicycles or tricycles anymore. He doesn't have children. But he sees them as being still functional with a little repair, and he will recycle them back. But 
but he has to make sure that they don't get beyond that line. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an interesting thing about our society is that there's always these lines. Yeah, well, that line is an interesting one because up until five years ago, you could cross that line, get the tires, get the trucks, do this, get the fridge, go in there, root around, and drive home. Now that we've got waste management programs in municipalities, we've got fences, we've got a guy who sits in the shack to make sure you don't go in there and you have a ticket or a card, an ID card to go into your dump. Which is all of which is a good thing, coming from the very best of places and for the very best of reasons. And it, it makes it difficult to pick through the garbage. So, you know, we'll sort that one out. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. What's best to have sort of an organized garbage um, kind of dump process or picking, and I guess we'll find a compromise somewhere. And, and, and there's a there's a neat place out in uh, Scarborough where um, if you're if you got a whole bunch of junk around, you want to get rid of it, but you want other people to get it, you take it out there and just give it to them, and then they sell. It. So it's a business for them. I've seen those start. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of neat things going. Well, home construction because of the mass renovation that's happening with people's homes, uh, people are now able to do recycle home. Uh, like if you're carrying out a sink yeah. or a bathroom and new old fixtures, <coughs> yep. which makes a lot more sense than throwing in for a dump site and filling for dump sites quickly. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's almost nine o'clock. I mean, um, it's been uh, nice talking. <laughs> <laughs>